In the province of Gujarat in the northeast of India lies a semi-arid region dotted with a kind of vegetation and landscape which resembles the savannas of East Africa. Inland, there is a massive 1,883 square kilometers national park, the Gir National Park, which shelters and protects animals which are increasingly under threat from the incessant growth of the human population. This is a reserve for many Indian species, but it owes its status to one species in particular, the most powerful one in the region, the Asian lion. Gear's ecosystem has attained significant stability since the park was first created. Once man's capacity to destroy was halted, its ability to regenerate itself has returned to previous high levels, thereby allowing 32 species of mammals, 26 species of reptiles and 300 species of birds to thrive. The dry deciduous forest and the tall grasses of the gentle hills of Gir are the last refuge of the Asian lion, a subspecies which once could be found in many parts of Asia, from southern Greece to India now only exists here in Gir in the national park, which was specifically created to save it from extinction. These are the lions which King Asurbanipal of Assyria hunted as immortalized in paintings and reliefs from Nineveh. They became extinct in Israel in the 13th century, in Pakistan in the 18th, and in Arabia and Iraq. They survived in remote isolated areas up until the beginning of this century. Now they are rare zoological specimens in danger of extinction. Few people take any interest in them, and most people do not even know that they exist. More than 300 Asian lions, enclosed in their small, little-known Indian sanctuary, conserve the genetic makeup inherited from the legendary Assyrian lions. Man has driven them to the verge of extinction, but paradoxically it is thanks to their relation with the indigenous people of this area that the Asian lions have survived in the forest of Gir. All of this region has a monsoon climate which is very hot during the dry season. The temperature ranges from 10 degrees centigrade in winter to 43 degrees in summer. The monsoon rains vary a great deal from year to year, and it is not uncommon for droughts to mark the landscape. When there is little rain, the seven permanent watercourses in gear dry up. To avoid this disaster, those in charge of the park have built four reservoirs in four of the main rivers. These act as a water reserve for the thirsty fauna during the summers in Gear, as well as enabling some fish and large marsh crocodiles to live there. The water does not only maintain the population of wild animals. Every day, the flocks of Maldaris arrive at the banks of the rivers and lakes. These people who make their living rearing livestock were a part of the ecosystem long before the park was created.
The Maldanis live in small settlements surrounded by thorny fences known as nesses. In the past, when the region was rich in pastures and had abundant supplies of water, the Maldaris had large flocks spread out over a wide area. The progressive loss of pasture caused by population increase and the demands of the livestock made the 129 nesses in gear an imminent danger to the wild herbivores and consequently to the ecosystem as a whole. When the park was created, a large number of the 845 Maldari families were rehoused outside the protected area, and today there are 361 families housed in 54 nesses still remaining inside the park. The traditional thorn fences which surround the Maldari settlements, known as nesses, are the only apparent means of protection that the farmers take to protect their animals from the lions and leopards which thrive in the forest. Many generations living with the big cats have taught both man and animals to tolerate each other so that the Maldaris can wander at their leisure through the thick forest without risking their lives and without carrying guns with which to kill the lions. The life of the Maldaris revolves around their livestock. Their buffaloes provide the milk which feeds them, as well as the manure which they sell as fuel in neighboring cities. Some of the Maldaris who were resettled outside the park have started to work the land, but most of them are not interested in agriculture. Their identity as a tribe is closely linked to livestock, particularly buffaloes and some dromedaries, which they use for riding. The animals are milked at dawn. They make different dairy products with the nutritious buffalo milk, in particular ghee, an amazingly nourishing butter which, like the manure, is sold outside the park. In this way, they obtain money to buy essential products which cannot be found in the forest of gear. Livestock provides the basis for the Maldari economy and its subsistence. Each animal is important and buffaloes and dromedaries are part of the community. However, the domestic livestock is something completely different for the wild animals. For the park's herbivores, the buffaloes are invincible competitors and for the carnivores, they are the easiest and most succulent prey to catch, although they are normally accompanied by humans who are feared and respected. The life of the ecosystem is sustained by a balance between these four pillars, man, his livestock, the wild herbivores, and the hunting carnivores. This balance demands sacrifices and concessions from all sides. The farmer's buffaloes take advantage of the vegetation in the area, thereby limiting the food, and as a result, the number of wild herbivores. In this way, man benefits from the ecosystem, but they must pay the price of the reduction in the number of the herbivores that feed the lions. They pay the price with the buffaloes, which from time to time are hunted by the felines. The number of buffaloes killed by the lions depends on the density of population of the wild herbivores. Now that the park's protective measures have allowed the populations of chitals, nilgais and wild boar to grow, 
70% of the lion's diet is provided by these animals. In the past, however, when thousands of buffaloes and zebus devastated the pastures of gear, livestock provided 75% of the big cat's food. The Maldaris fought against them, and both men and lions were often killed. The wild animals have better developed senses and are faster than the Maldari livestock. This means but they are more difficult to catch, and this is why buffaloes quite often end up in the lion's clutches. Asian lions, unlike their African counterparts, rarely associate with lionesses outside the mating season. In Africa, the wild animals that they hunt are large and can feed all of the pride. But here, the chitals, their most common source of food, rarely reach 50 kilos, so hunting is done on an individual basis. The males, which in Africa take advantage of the catches of the female members of the group, must depend on themselves, and they are the ones who are most often tempted by the easily caught livestock. A buffalo involves a lot less effort for many more kilos of meat. The females very rarely attack livestock. They prefer chitals and wild boars inside the forest and rarely come near the nesses of the Maldaris. In 1965, when the Gear region was made into a sanctuary for wild animals, the ecosystem was already depleted. 21,000 livestock animals grazed on the dry fields, and this number tripled during the monsoon. 90% of the grass was consumed by domestic animals, which made life difficult for the wild herbivores, which were also infected with diseases carried by the livestock. But with the work of the Lion of Gear project, the situation has improved. Now the ecosystem has regenerated itself and the population of herbivores has become healthier. The Nilgais, the biggest antelopes in Asia, are numerous in all of the region. Locally they are known as blue cows, a name which has saved them from the greed of the hunters in a country where the cow is a sacred animal. Among the herbivores of Gear, there are also sambars, chitals, and chikara gazelles, antelopes with four horns, and a small population of black antelopes. Before India became independent, the black antelope was the most common wild animal in the country. But in spite of being a sacred animal for the Vishnua and the Valas, and in spite of being Krishna's favorite antelope and a national emblem of India, its population has fallen from over four million down to about 25,000 in all of the country. The balance between predators and prey keeps the forest of gear in a permanent state of renewal. The vegetation and different species of animals vary considerably according to the topology of the park, giving rise to two distinct areas. The soil in the valley is deeper and more clay than that of the hills, which allows for leafier vegetation. This is the part where the rivers flow and where the deciduous teak forest appears, an oasis in this semi-arid region of Gujarat.
The watercourses in the forest are lands of plenty for the animals. There are more species than on the eastern hills where the vegetation is scarcer and less developed. During the dry season, the valley becomes the water reserve for the whole park and allows the life of all the biological community to continue. The eastern hills are more open and treeless. There are forests of acacias and large pastures of succulent grass, which, without being as impressive as the teak forest, still provide food for the herbivores and give shelter to a wide variety of steppe fauna. In such an exposed habitat as the grassland, camouflaging is essential. The pin-tailed sand grouse know this, and their chicks, staying still during their parents' absence, turn into tiny pebbles on the stony ground, thereby confusing their predators. Camouflaging is less important for carnivores. They have hardly any natural enemies inside the park, and their sharpened senses allow them to obtain food, even though it is as well hidden as a cicada in the grass. The Gear Visitors Center has been set up in a fenced-off area of 412 hectares inside the sanctuary in the Devalia area. This includes an example of all the different habitats to be found in the park, as well as its most characteristic animals. It is a synthesis of the Forest of Gear, which reduces the burden on the park of tourism and enables those visitors who cannot spend more than one or two days at the reserve to see the most interesting animals. The number of lions in Gyer has outgrown the capacity of the park and the struggle for territory has intensified. Four or five satellite populations have moved to the outlying areas of Gyer and the new males that reach adulthood are drawn to the 412 hectare area of the visitor center where only one male lives. As a consequence, there are frequent clashes at the protective fence. The park rangers are obliged to watch these encounters closely because on some occasions several males have teamed up on the outside to try to take control of the fenced off area and their attacks have knocked the fence down. While the metal wire remains in place, the lions will not be harmed and will desist in their struggles after exhausting themselves with several hours of growling and banging. Asian lions started evolving differently from their African counterparts at some stage between 55,000 and 200,000 years ago. Now the two subspecies have different genetic, osteological and morphological features, the latter being obvious from the outside. The Asian lions have a characteristic crease on their stomachs, virtually non-existent in African lions. Although the lock of hair at the end of the tail is bigger in the Asian lion, the mane is much shorter than in the African lion. They are slightly smaller, and as the population fell to a minimum of 20, their genetic variability has been lost. However, the characteristic which most distinguishes the two species of lion is their behavior towards man.
Nowhere else in the world do men dare to set off in search of lions armed with nothing more than a stick. The gear guards patrol and observe the big cats walking through the forest without fear of being attacked. The lions camouflage themselves perfectly in the brown vegetation and tall grass so that encounters occur at very short distances. Nevertheless, the lions of gear rarely behave aggressively towards humans. Only young animals approach man with a sense of curiosity. Generally, the animal gets up and walks away quietly without showing fear when an intruder comes closer than what they judge to be a safe distance. But in the case of the more inquisitive and more enterprising young lions, the safety distance is reduced and they come forward to view the guards or the members of the film crew more closely. Inside gear, the lions do not pose any danger to humans, but outside the park where livestock has devastated the pastures and there are few wild herbivores, the lions feed on domestic cattle and on occasion on the people who look after and protect them. From the middle of 1988 to the beginning of 1990, lions attacked people 100 times, usually when they went to try to save their livestock, and 15 people were devoured by the lions. However, within the sanctuary, there is a plentiful supply of food and the government pays the Maldari for the buffaloes that are killed by the lions so that they are not attacked despite the coexistence between man and the lions. This tolerance of man has saved the Asian lion from extinction in extremis. The Indian government is currently investigating the possibility of introducing new groups of lions into other parks. But if it is already difficult to fence off forested areas in a country where a thousand million people are struggling to obtain new fields to farm, then settling them with a super predator like the Asian lion, which puts people in danger, will be a great deal more complicated. Today, the forest of Gear protects the last bastion of a legendary animal. The number of lions in the park has reached the maximum limit that the ecosystem can stand, and the lions need new settlements. But in an overpopulated India, the job of finding new lands is getting more and more difficult. And today, Gear keeps hope alive for the forgotten Asian lion. <laughs>